All right, we ready? I posted today that I'll, I'm pushing the homework two due date back. Um, the last problem is a multivariate analysis of variance or MANOVA problem, and we haven't covered that yet. So I'm going to cover that today and Wednesday. I would have just pushed the homework back to, say, Thursday so that everybody had time to see the lectures and everything. Um, the folks who are following along at a distance, though, they work full time often. Um, so weekends are when they can do their work. So I'm just going to go ahead and put it back to uh, Sunday. Um, you have an exam on Wednesday. And uh, I'll say something briefly about, about that. We'll spend a little more time doing a review when it gets a little closer. But for now, what to expect on the exam. So it will be here. And we'll take it during the normal time period. Having said that, I'll be here as early as I can. I think we have the room uh, for 20 minutes before the start of our class time. So you are welcome to be here a little bit early. Um, but we'll go ahead and finish at 3.50 PM Central. The exam will be done in R. Um, and I'm going to give you a choice of problems. Well, actually, you're going to get my choice for you of a couple of problems. So I have three things I want to ask you on the exam. <clears throat> and you're going to get two of them. You don't know which two you're going to get. So I want you to be ready to do all three. Um, but with the, the short time frame we have for actually the class, I've had trouble in previous years with people running out of time. If I have to do something in R, it takes me a little while to do it. So I'm going to try to make the content relatively low. Um, with the trade-off being you need to be ready for um, all of this that I tell you about. So I want you to be able to do some basic vector and matrix operations in R. So I might say on the exam, let V be the vector 3, 1, minus 1, 0. And let capital B be this 4 by 3 matrix or something. Compute A transpose B. Compute B inverse Compute the eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of B, um, the basic operations that we've done in our script so far. You will have your notes. You'll have all of my scripts and all of your homeworks and solutions and everything available to you. You can use whatever you want. Just don't communicate with others. So one category of problem, or bunch of sub-problems, we'll be doing some uh, basic R coding to do vector matrix operations. The other thing that I will task some of you with is to do with the multivariate normal distribution. So specifically, uh, you've seen a function for simulating multivariate normal data. So in one of your homeworks, you um, in homework one, you simulated a bunch of multivariate normal data. And you figured out what proportion of the time did the, the sample mean fall within a, a confidence region. So you have a function in R that you can use that will give you, here's like a sample of 1,000 observations of a three-dimensional normal distribution. You can simulate data. So in order to kind of assess you on multivariate normal stuff, which we spent a good bit of time on, I'll ask you to do um, a simulation exercise with the multivariate normal distribution. For example, simulate a, a sample of size 1,000 from the bivariate normal with this mean and with this covariance matrix. Make a, uh, make a picture or something, something really simple. So uh, multivariate normal, I want you to be comfortable with um, what it means, what it is, is a probability distribution. So, um, and we have some probability results, like confidence regions are, are these ellipsoids and things like that. So I'll, I'll make that a little clearer before we get right on the exam, because that was pretty vague. But I, I want one of the categories to be uh, do some simulation stuff with the multivariate normal. And then the third category, is t squared multivariate inference on a mean vector. So I, would, I will give you a data set. 
download a CSV file from eCampus, load that into R, and then do, say, a uh, hotelings T squared test and give me the statistic and the p value. Characterize, maybe even sketch the confidence ellipsoid for the mean vector. Um, that'll probably be basically it. I'll keep it simple. So those are the th main things that I want you to be kind of preparing for for the exam. What I wanted to do this week, um, today and Wednesday, is yes. You can use any resources you like, except for talking to other people. So you can use the internet. Um, how to simulate from multivariate normal? Pull that up. That's fine. Uh, I want to go through topic six really quickly. We spent a, a good bit of time on topic five because it had uh, the core material that's repeated in topic six. Topic five was all about like multivariate statistical inference on a mean vector. And then topic six just generalizes that to what if we want to compare mean vectors. So I have the mean vector under treatment A and mean vector under treatment B, is there a treatment effect? Is there a difference between these uh, mean vectors? Um, but the theory is virtually identical. So we'll go pretty quickly through topic six. And let me just revisit um, the, the stuff that was in the video from Friday. The, the confidence regions versus confidence intervals. Just to give a, a, a quick summary on that topic, uh, you can construct a confidence region for a mean vector. That's one thing you can do. I'm 95% confident that the mean vector is contained in this ellipsoid. That's a confident statement about the whole mean vector altogether. The simultaneous intervals that you also learned about were for when you want confident statements for the individual components, not the whole vector all at once, but the individual components. So one kind of hypothetical example of, of, that illustrates why you like both of those is suppose you work for a company and you manufacture a particular device. And for that device, there's five quality measurements, numeric, uh, numeric variables, five of them. And for your product to be up to specifications, those five variables have to be within a, an acceptable, tolerable range, or at least not beyond some thresholds. So for the purpose of uh, describing overall whether you're meeting specifications, you could get a confidence region for the whole mean vector. I'm confident that our entire process is operating within tolerances. But suppose that you get a, a small uh, or suppose that your observed mean vector is not in that interval, you have evidence that uh, the, um, no, let me scratch that. Suppose you have evidence that you're not within tolerances. Then the natural next question is, well, which of my variables is off? Okay, overall, we're not up to specifications. What I want to know next is which of the variables is the source of it being off? Are they all off? Or is it just the first one and the third one, or what? So the confidence region is useful for kind of overall assessment. And the simultaneous intervals are for being more specific about each component. And the kind of maybe confusing math mathematics behind the, the simultaneous intervals is because if you want intervals about which you can say they're all 95% confidence intervals. You have to be careful about how you construct them. And in particular, if you just do the usual T-based, one at a time, 95% confidence intervals on five variables at the same time, you don't have 95% confidence intervals anymore. There's lower confidence overall. The simultaneous stuff is math and probability that's designed to guard against that so that the separate intervals you get, you can say each one of those is a 95% confidence interval. So topic six, we're going to now think about uh, what if we have 
more than one mean vector. The simplest case is when we have two mean vectors. We have a control group and we have a treatment group. Do my numeric variables change on average in the treatment regime versus the control regime? Um, so it's like in topic five, we were doing one sample t, t tests. In the univariate case, we might want to do inference on whether a univariate mean equals a particular value. That's the usual t, t stuff, one sample t stuff. Topic six, we're going to generalize to the two sample t test, where I want to compare this group to that group. A special case of that is the paired t test, where uh, maybe it's control group and treatment group, but each individual gets put into both groups. So I'm going to give you the control for two weeks, and then I'll give you the treatment for two weeks. Everybody gets both measurements. That's a specialized case of a two-sample problem. We call it a paired problem. And then if you have more than two mean vectors, um, it becomes akin to ANOVA in the univariate case. ANOVA is all about comparing the means across categories of another variable. Let me just draw my usual ANOVA picture. ANOVA is suitable when you have some numeric response and a categorical factor or just a categorical variable that defines categories. So we could have an arbitrary number of categories. There's A, B, C, and so on. So this could be control and treatment and another treatment and another treatment just a generalization to more than two groups. Then ANOVA is all about, let's suppose we have box plots for the data that we observe. ANOVA is all about asking, do those box plots shift across the categories of X? If they do, then there's an effect of X. If you change X, you see a difference in the average values of Y. So ANOVA is about modeling this type of picture, and it gives us a p-value, yes or no, does it look like those box plots shift? Of course they will shift in practice, just because of random variation. But the question is, the inference question, is do they shift more than would be expected by chance? And the way that we do that, just FYI, this will help with what's coming in the notes, the way we assess, do, is there a factor X effect, is we compare the two different sources of variation. Analysis of variance is what ANOVA is. So we, ana we analyze, we compare variation, two different sources of variation. First, we characterize the within group variability, like if you just look at one category of X, how variable is it within that category? And compare that to how variable are the boxes themselves in terms of their means. So we compare these into a variability estimate and call it between group variability. So if the between group variability is big relative to the within group variability, then we'll have a small p-value. Let me show you another picture like this one. I'll show you two of them. So here's y and here's x. And same picture, but a different scenario. Um, for x, suppose we have just three categories, a, b, c. And suppose that in each case, the average response for the different categories is uh, this collection of values. The averages of the response in each case. So I'm trying to draw these exactly the same. But two different scenarios for variation 
in the population. So in one scenario, there's lots and lots of variation. And in the other scenario, there's very little. So in terms of testing, we could consider a null hypothesis that the mean response in A is the same as that in B and the same as that in C. And that's a sensible null hypothesis then. Does X have any relationship or association with the response? That's the ANOVA null hypothesis. Under which picture would you intuitively want to say there's greater evidence um, against the null hypothesis? Which of those two pictures would you, would you say argues more strongly that the means are not the same? Okay, so let's think about it. This one, the means are different. They're different in both cases. The mean for A is up here, sample mean. This is what I observed in my data. Sample mean, sample mean. They differ. The difference is not zero. But there's a lot of variation within each of those categories. So if you imagine resampling this exact scenario, you'd see some bobbing around. And those averages would be going all up and down the red boxes. So this particular picture, it doesn't suggest very strongly that the means are really different. If we were to rerun the experiment, we'd easily see very different um, lining up of the sample means. Whereas in the right picture, um, it's the opposite scenario. So this is what I meant up here by ANOVA and therefore multivariate ANOVA is all about comparing the within group variation to the between group variation. And in the blue or in the green case here, the between group variation is substantial relative to the within group. It's all about how far apart are the means relative to how wide are the boxes. So this would be a large ANOVA p-value, and this would be a small ANOVA p-value. So in the multivariate case, we're going to basically mimic this. Instead of variances, like sums of squared deviations from the sample mean, instead of variances, we'll use covariances. But it'll be the same kind of assessment. What's the within group covariance matrix compared to the between group covariance matrix? OK. Um, the first little batch of notes here, I'm going to go, I think I'm just going to skip it. I'm going to jump right to uh, the next little section. This section is all about paired designs, which is a special case of the uh, two sample. It's also a special case of the one sample case. So if you know how to do the one sample t squared stuff, you know how to do paired comparison stuff. Let's go to what's new. And that is starting on slide 17 about comparing two mean vectors. In the univariate case, this is a review of the two sample t test and associated inference. So we use notation like this now. We say x11 through xn11. Those are the samples, uh, sampled individuals from comparison group one. We have two comparison groups, x11 through xn11. That's the n1 individuals from group one, the control group, maybe. And then x12, x22 up to xn22 is our sample from the second group. And in the t-test case, the univariate t-test case, we usually assume normality. There's ways around this, but the classical assumption for a t-test is that the population distribution is normal. 
So for a two-sample t-test, we assume that both populations are normal. The control group is a bunch of realizations from a normal distribution. And the treatment group is a different normal distribution. We allow each of the distributions to have their own parameter values. So group 1 has mu1 and sigma1 squared, and group 2 has mu2 and sigma2 squared. And we're assuming that every observation is independent of every other observation. Within group 1, for example, we have a random sample, an IID sample from some normal distribution. And within group 2, we have another IID sample. And group 1 and group 2 observations are independent of one another. An example of when they might not be is the paired design. If each individual, if each of my n individuals is exposed to treatment group 1 and treatment group 2, then there's correlation between the groups. This stuff is all about everybody's independent. And then if we want to test a particular null hypothesis, for example, we're often interested in means. So the null hypothesis we could consider is, is the difference in means equal to some hypothesized value, usually zero. Is there any difference in the average between these two groups? When we do a two-sample t-test, we have a little more complexity than in the one-sample case. And the same thing happens in multivariate applications. So STAT 101 says if you want to compare two means with a t-test, you have normal data in both groups. Everybody's independent. If you want to compare the two means, you, you need to answer a question for us first. Number one, the question is, are the variances in the two groups the same? The way we wrote it originally, we're allowing for each of the two groups to have their, their own variance. We definitely want to allow them to have different means, because that's what we want to do inference on. What's the difference in the means? But if we're, do we think that uh, the variances are the same, or should they be allowed to be different? With t-tests, it makes a difference. The math gets, uh, looks different, more complicated, if you want to allow for different variances in the two groups. So one assumption that's often used is that the variances are the same. And if you assume the variances are the same, then this is the t-statistic. This is the two-sample t-statistic. Notice that it looks of a form similar to the one-sample t-statistic. The one-sample t-test statistic was sample mean minus the mean under the null hypothesis divided by s over the square root of n. And we said that's like the estimate of the parameter that we're trying to do inference on, minus what we think the parameter is under the null, divided by the standard deviation of the estimate. And similarly, the two sample t-test is of this form, estimated mean difference minus what we think the mean difference is under the null hypothesis, divided by this quantity that's an estimate of the standard deviation of our estimate. So both of these are of the form estimate minus null value divided by SD of estimate. So this slide here is a review of that. That's a one sample t-test. We compute this statistic. That's our test statistic. It's our quantification of the evidence against the null hypothesis. And if it's a big extreme value, that suggests the null is not true. We computed this incorrectly because the null is not true. So it doesn't look like we expect it to. It's way extreme. How, ext how extreme is extreme enough? is based on, as always, the sampling distribution of that statistic. 
So the math says that when the null hypothesis is true, that t statistic follows a t distribution. This is the one. This is a t distribution with n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom. Confidence intervals and p-values come from that t distribution. This is just the slide of what if we don't assume the variances are the same in the two groups. So this is the unequal variance t-test. And STAT 101 always has this formula just to scare people. This is the approximate degrees of freedom of the t-distribution. And then one more thing on the univariate side that is applicable to the multivariate side too. Suppose we have uh, a random sample from group one and a random sample from group two. But we're not confident that the distributions are normal. Maybe they're uh, part per million contaminants or something. Something that can't be negative. Maybe it's a right skewed distribution that we're sampling from in these two groups. Not normal. So t-tests are not applicable. t-tests are only applicable when your data are normal. Um, and again, suppose that we want to test the null hypothesis about the difference in the means. Usually, are the difference in the means equal to zero? So we can't use a t-test. But, as is often the case with inference, if you have a large sample size, it doesn't matter. Because with a large sample size, the, the distribution, the sampling distribution of our statistic approaches something predictable, a normal distribution. So if the sample size is big, even if you don't have normally distributed data, you compute this statistic, which is just a little bit different from the one we saw a few slides ago, and then we can compare that to the standard normal distribution. Little z is uh, statistical jargon for standard normal. That's the normal with mean 0, variance 1. As degrees of freedom increase, t distributions converge to normal distributions. So we use t-based inference when we think we have uh, normally distributed data and we don't have a really big sample size. If we do have a really big sample size, it doesn't matter whether the data are normal or not, the statistic still converges to a normal, standard normal. So in the multivariate case, we're gonna have a similar kind of breakdown. Do you wanna say that the variances, in this case covariances are the same between the two groups, yes or no? And what happens if you don't have multivariate normality? So this looks intimidating. I won't make you uh, do much, if any, calculation along these lines. Um, but I will, you will use R to do the calculations for you. But this is the setup of the two-sample t-squared test. It's just like the previous setup, except now, instead of uh, scalar observations, we have vectors. So here's my random sample of vectors from group one. We assume that they are multivariate normal now with a mean vector and a covariance matrix. Then here's my random sample from group two, multivariate normal, its own mean, its own covariance for now. Everybody's independent of everybody else. So I'm actually only going to show you the sip. No, I think I have it later. Yeah, I do. So let's start with the simple case. Uh, if the covariances are the same, we're doing a two-sample t-test, basically. And one of the questions when doing that is, is the variance in the two groups the same? We now have covariances. So the question is, are the covariances the same? If they are then we're going to compute a t-squared statistic. In the middle of the screen, there's this really long expression that if you look at it from, a, from back a bit, 
looks just like a t-squared statistic. It's something minus a mean transpose, the inverse of a weighting matrix, something minus a mean. Now we're doing comparison of two means, though. So it's, a, it's an estimated mean difference, x1 bar minus x2 bar, minus the actual mean difference, transpose. And this is just carefully constructed to be the covariance matrix that we need. But fundamentally, it's a t-squared statistic. Difference, transpose, weighting matrix inverse, difference, not transpose. The pooled covariance matrix is written out here. It looks really messy, but it's the same fundamental idea as the, the univariate pooled statistic. Uh, I'm not, well, this numerator here is like the sum of, of uh, cross products in group one. And this is the sum of cross products in group two. If you think the covariances are the same, you might as well just pool all the cross products within the groups because they should all be representative of the same covariance. So we're taking the unscaled covariance in group one and adding it to the unscaled covariance in group two to just pool together all the co uh, cross products. Then divide by an appropriate number of degrees of freedom. So it's like an average covariance. So that's my spiel on it. It's a, a pooled covariance matrix. This is then the statistic. And as always, to do statistical inference, we need to know the sampling distribution of that statistic. So the distribution is given down below. It, again, should look familiar, but a little bit more complicated than the one sample case. Now it's the sum of the two sample sizes minus 2 times p divided by that times an f random variable. So in practice, you would have uh, in your data set rows for individuals, and then you'd have p columns for the numeric variables that you're, that you're uh, assaying in group one. Uh, let's see, how would we want to do this? OK, you would have, uh, let's say, two times n rows. I'll just draw it. So two sample t squared scenario. Your data, call it 2n by p. One way to organize your data would be to say, here's my group 1, individual 1, or group 1, variable 1, <laughs> individual 1, group 1, let's say, individual 1, variable 2. Group 1, individual 2. Group 1, variable 2. Group 1, the nth individual in group 1. And then, group 2. Um, and then what we might do in our data set is also have a, an additional variable, call it uh, C, that is 2n by 1. And it is the group membership variable. So up here, maybe I could put C. And it's just 1 for all the group 1s and 2 for all the group 2s. All I'm trying to do here is just visualize, like, what type of data do you have that you would do this with? You have two comparison groups, 
you want to ask, is the mean vector of these numeric inputs the same between groups? Uh, I'll just briefly go through this. In order to do the, the two sample t test, if you want to test a particular null hypothesis expressed in terms of a difference in means, usually set equal to zero, are the mean vectors the same in my two comparison groups? Then the test statistic that we'll use involves that hypothesized difference. It's like estimate minus null value transpose, covariance matrix inverse, and then estimate minus null value. Another t squared statistic. The reference distribution is the one we had on the previous slide. It's this new scaled f. So we could get a p value. If I wanted to test that null hypothesis using that result, we could get a p value. We can also get a confidence region for the mean difference. And we do it virtually identically to the way that we did it in the one sample case. The confidence region for the mean difference is defined by the ellipsoid of constant distance c squared from the sample mean difference. Basically, you do the eigen decomposition of this pooled covariance matrix, and that tells you the principal axes and the half length. That's a confidence region. And then we also learned about two flavors of simultaneous component by component confidence intervals. There's the t squared intervals. Those are like the shadow uh, drop downs to the axes intervals. They're valid, 95, or they're valid simultaneous confidence intervals, but they're wider than they have to be. So their true, quote, cr coverage will be bigger than 95%. They're conservative. And you can do better in terms of being more efficient using the Bonferroni intervals. But both of these results are direct uh, images of the one sample case. We've just replaced sample means with sample mean differences. And this covariant stuff has been uh, revised a little bit to reflect this covariance. Same thing down here with the Bonferroni intervals. So with that presented, you know how to do two sample t-squared tests. I'll just mention that when you don't think the covariances are the same, just like in the univariate t-test, there's a multivariate unequal covariances t-test. And it's got a really messy expression for the number of degrees of freedom, just like the univariate t-test would always let software do that for me. Just like with the univariate t-test, we said we assume normality. If we want to do a two sample comparison, we have to decide are the variance is equal or not. But then we had the uh, slide that said, well, if you have a big sample size, it doesn't matter anyway. With a big sample size, there's the standard normal. That's the approximate null distribution of the t-statistic. Similarly, if we have a large sample size, this general version of the t-squared statistic has a predictable distribution. The square of a standard normal random variable is a chi-square random variable. In the univariate case, we computed this general t-statistic and it was a standard normal. This is a t-squared statistic so maybe not surprisingly, the limiting distribution is a chi-square distribution. But again, if you have big sample sizes, you can apply, in many cases, a large sample approximate result to do statistical inference. Um, I think I'll show you an example next time. Let me see if I have these. Let 
let me just show you an example of how to do this in R. Um, okay. So in R. Um, I can get that one, I think. Can I get this one? Do a plot trick. So this is uh, from an example in an old textbook. You, I don't think this is from your textbook. This is just an example data set that we have uh, summary statistics for. I don't actually have a CSV file for this data set. I have sample size. N1 and N2 are both 50. It's just a bivariate problem. P is equal to 2. And these are the summary statistics. This is what was provided for us in the textbook. Just X bar in group 1 and X bar in group 2. S in group 1 and S in group 2. So I'm going to run all of that. X bar 1 is a vector of length 2. S1 is a matrix 2 by 2. So let's go look at our slide for the two sample t test, t squared test. So in these data, uh, we have These sample means, we have two variables. We have two groups, 50 individuals each. In group one, we have an average of 8.3 comma 4.1. And in group two, it's 10.2 comma 3.9. We want to test. Clearly, they're different. There's non-zero differences between those two vectors. But we want to test, are those differences that we can see greater than we would expect just by chance. If we went and got another 50 and another 50, did x bar 1, x bar 2, we'd see differences that would be a little bit different. So are these bigger, far, away, far enough away from zero differences for us to say that couldn't have happened by chance at a 95% confidence level, say? I want to test the null hypothesis that the mean difference, the population mean difference, is equal to, we'll do zero. So my statistic, my t squared statistic, is the difference in the sample means minus 0. Transpose, we need to compute this s pooled thing. That scaled, inverted, and then this difference again. So over here. What I'm doing in this, in this line right here is computing the pooled covariance matrix. This S pooled. This expression is the same as this expression. I'm taking the sample covariance matrix in group one and unscaling it so that it's just the sum of cross products. And I'm adding that to the cross products from group two, treating them as they are interchangeable. I'm assuming the variances are the same. And then I divide by the appropriate number of degrees of freedom. So this will be, in some sense, an average of S1 and S2. It is an average, exactly. Then we can play with our new toys. We can get a confidence ellipse for the mean difference. So to get a confidence ellipse, um, this is my statistic. And I want to know the ellipsoid that is equidistant from the mean difference. Okay, So I want um, to decompose the weighting matrix here in the middle. 
It's like x transpose a x that we saw way back in topic two. And the ellipsoid of constant distance involves the eigen decomposition of that a. Here our a is this big thing inverted. Um, so I went the route of decomposing s pooled. It doesn't matter whether you decompose s pooled or s pooled inverse as long as you keep the, the details straight in what follows. So I'll just run this and draw the picture. So here is the 95% uh, confidence ellipsoid based on these data. I'm 95% confident that the true mean difference, whatever it is, is contained in that ellipsoid. With regard to my null hypothesis that the mean difference is zero, um, <clears throat> yeah, with regard to that null hypothesis, how would you conclude? Ba based on my confidence region, a 95% confidence region, would you feel confident rejecting the null hypothesis or not? You would because the null hypothesized value, 0, 0, is not contained in there. Confidence regions and hypothesis tests are two sides of the same coin. If the null hypothesized value is not in your confidence region, then you have a p-value of 1 minus your confidence level, and vice versa. So here, based on this confidence region, I can confidently reject the null hypothesis that we wrote down. Notice that for variable 2, a difference of 0 doesn't look implausible at all. The ellipsoid is well away from 0 on the first variable. But it straddles 0, essentially, on the second variable. But overall, in a simultaneous multivariate sense, we reject the null claim that both means are equal to 0. This is a good illustration, by the way, of why you want simultaneous confidence intervals. Because in this case, I rejected the null hypothesis. I don't think the mean difference is 0, the vector. But it's really all because of just one of the two variables. So a simultaneous confidence interval for variable 1 would contain 0, whereas the one for mu2 will not. So just to reiterate, in practice, it's nice to have both a confidence region and confidence intervals. All right, I think I'll let you go there. Um, what follows in the topic six slides is an example of using MANOVA. Uh, there's an easier way to do it. There is a named function for MANOVA. So if you like lots of technical code, by all means, read through. Um, but I will show you a MANOVA function that you can use. All right. I will have a Q&A tonight. I will. See you Wednesday.